Hey everyone, Cursed Deck Builder here, and we are looking at a Tiamat Dragon Tribal deck. This deck was sent to me by CLBRN4, or Coolburn4, as I would pronounce it. And they say, here's my dragon deck. It feels like a mid-power 5-ish, and I'd like it to be a 7. Would love your suggestions. So first off, as always, this deck list will be in the description of the YouTube video. So I highly, highly suggest that you open it up yourself and follow along and see what kind of different suggestions you might have and where you and I agree and where we disagree. The second thing I'll do right off the bat before we get into the deck is very briefly have a quick talk about power level. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go from the uh, top of it and say power level is not real. It's made up. It is a... Uh, form of quantifiable, you know, measurement that just does not apply. So don't worry too much about it. I find power level and those conversations are a lot easier when people actually talk about their deck, actually talk about what kind of, um, like if there's a budget, the kind of tutors, uh, how, how strong it is in combos it has, like that, that's a better conversation. But the other thing that power level can be useful for is by understanding it less like a scale and more like milestones. Coolburn 4 is looking at their deck and finding it middle powered. And then they would like it to go up two notches. And from that, we can make a few guesses as what that means. Probably about deck cohesion, probably about success of winning, probably at a, a level that they feel like the deck is doing what they want it to do, and and so on and so forth. It is it is a bit it is a short message they sent me, so we're going to work with what we have. But the idea that it wants to go up in power, it gives us a direction to work with, right? And going from five to seven is not from, like going five to ten. It gives us a an idea that we want small increments that go probably in the same direction without introducing too new of an idea. So let's take a look at Time At. Time At is a seven mana, five color dragon that says when you cast Time At and it enters play, you tutor five dragon cards from your deck into your hand. This is very, very powerful. I am a big fan of this being your commander. I know there's other five mana color uh, dragons for five color dragons, but I like this here because it gives us a very powerful effect in the command zone and it lets me also say, we're not going to worry about card draw, right? Because you have a card that for seven mana draws five cards. That's fantastic. Five, five cards that are known and named bombs that you can drop on the battlefield. This is great. I love this. So now that we know what the commander does, we're going to do the second thing we always do. And we're going to scroll down and look at the curve. And a lot of people may have predicted this by the, by the sheer mention of a dragon deck. One assumes we have this little bubble right here. If we look at it, we can see that 32 of the cards, just, just shy of a third, are five mana and above. This is, as you might imagine, a lot. There's one thing to say that a lot of our dragons are going to be expensive, but we're using a lot of expensive cards across the board. So we're going to try to make that our main point of attack with our two two other things we're going to think about as we move forward is colors, colors of cards, and then we're going to talk about a, a game plan for the deck. Those are our three points we're going to hit, and we're going to hit them nice and fast. So I'm not going to be going through the high mana dragons. I'm not going to do that for two reasons. One, it's a dragon deck. The entire purpose of playing this deck is to play these dragons. I'm, I'm not going to argue with them. You should be playing all of these dragons. I like the collection of dragons. I don't think there's anything wrong with them. I have no reason to say that you shouldn't take them out. They are your bread and butter of this deck. What I am going to look for is the high mana cost in every other section. These four here. So let's go through them quickly. Artifacts, we've got Timeless Lotus and Vanquisher's Banner at much higher of a rate than everything else. Timeless Lotus is a bit of a trap in a deck like this, 
I know it feels like it solves a lot of problems because it taps for five colors and it ramps you with for all five of those colors at once. But you have to remember this deck doesn't have a need to go from five mana to 10. This deck has a need to go from three mana to seven, or let's say three mana to five even, because that's that's the goal, right? We want to start dropping dragons. We don't have a 10 mana dragon that we need to ramp into. So instead of this, I want Chromantic Lantern here. I know the Chromantic Lantern has a bit of a bad reputation these days because it's got this sense that you don't need that much fixing. It's too expensive for a mana rock. I'm going to tell you this is the exact kind of deck you want Chromatic Lantern. It tasks for all five of your colors, and it fixes your mana for the rest of your colors. So let's drop Timeless Lotus. Let's look at Chromatic Lantern. Next on the list is Vanquisher's Banner. Vanquisher's Banner is built for a different kind of tribal deck. Let's see the two things it does. You pick a creature type, so dragons. First, it gives your dragons plus one, plus one. And second, whenever you cast a creature spell of the chosen type, dragons, you draw a card. None of these are particularly strong in this deck, as they would be in like a soldier deck or an elf deck. The first thing to note is dragons are already big. Plus one, plus one on a seven, seven is kind of meaningless. So it doesn't really give us the effect that we want of growing our dragons. Furthermore, you're not going to have that many dragons out on the battlefield. They're, they're just too big. It takes too much of an effort to put them out. So on a really optimistic idea of having three plus dragons on the field, you know, you're still getting three to four extra power. That's less than just adding another dragon instead of playing this, right? So as for the plus one plus one, I don't like it. I don't think it's doing anything here. The next one is whenever you cast a creature spell. So a dragon creature spell, you'll draw a card. But when you really think about it, what that really says is you're just going to draw one card a turn. It is going to be very difficult for you to cast multiple dragons in, a, in one turn. So this is a really, really fancy Phyrexian Arena. And I don't think that's worth it for five mana. I don't think it's bringing a lot of work, like it's really helping out. So I want to get rid of this as well. Um, we're going to come back to inclusions at the end, uh, like what we're going to add at the end. But already, these two, I feel like we can cut. Let's go to instants. I generally like all of these. We're going to come back to the blue spells later. But Kindred Summons is the only card that sticks out as a seven mana card. And the main thing I want you to think about is two concepts. And that's floor and ceiling. So Kindred Summons says that for each dragon you have on the battlefield when you cast this, you're going to reveal up to that many dragons and put them into play. So what's the floor here? The floor is you have no dragons. That's a pretty low floor. That's seven mana do nothing. So if you cast this and someone destroys your only dragon, you get nothing. That's rough. But let's be generous and say that's not going to be the case. Traditionally, you're going to have one to two dragons, maybe three. This is a lot of mana. You're spending seven mana instead of casting a dragon to get the next few dragons off, off the top of your deck. What does that look like? What are the odds of getting a good dragon? And how many dragons does that make it worthwhile? I would say the sweet spot of that is two and higher. If you have two dragons in play and you resolve Kindred Summons, you get two dragons into play, two more dragons into play, I think that's worth it. If you regularly only have one or your opponents are removing dragons before while this is on the stack, countering the spell, then I don't like this card. I think there is, there is going to be a bit of a wide net you're throwing when you play this card, because much like Vanquisher's Banner, Kindred Summons is built for an elf deck or a go wide deck. Elves especially because the elves can tap to create the mana for Kindred Summons. And then you've got 10 elves, so you get 10 more elves into play. Dragons don't really work like that. That's why you have things like Sneak Attack, which are really good at putting one creature in as opposed to putting a bunch in. So Kindred Summons is mostly a no to me, but that being said, I do understand the power of it. 
So I'm going to say if you can regularly put have two or more dragons in play when you cast Kindred Summons, then I like it. Then I have no problem with that. Uh, you're going to have to test to find out. Looking at sorceries, this one's a lot more straightforward. I really like all of these sorceries. I like that we go into wrath spells up here because that's perfect. Once again, you are not building a wide board. You're building a tall board of very strong dragons that are like lightning rods to removal. So in the situations where your opponents are building their board and destroying your dragons, and you're starting your turn with no dragons in play, no creatures, wow, don't these cards look really, really good. Doesn't damnation look fantastic when your opponents have spent their resources to keep you down, and now you have no downside to wrath the board? Fantastic. I like this. But we're going to talk about Rishkar's expertise. Rishkar's expertise is not good here. And I'm going to tell you why. Remember earlier with Kindred, Kindred Summons, we looked at a floor and ceiling idea where the ceiling is that you get many dragons and many strong dragons, and the floor is you get no dragons or one weak dragon? Rishkar's expertise is a different kind of test we're going to apply. This is, called, this is what I like to think of the hoops test, where you have to see how many hoops you have to jump through to get this card to do anything at all. So the first thing it's asking is draw cards equal to the greatest power among creatures you control. What is the hoop? You need a creature. It shares this with Kindred Summons, but I want to be more specific with this because at least Kindred Summons has the valuability of being instant speed. So you can play around things if you want to, whereas Rishkar's expertise is sorcery. So the first thing you need is you need a creature. And let's be blunt, this also applies to Kindred Summons, it needs to not be one of these low mana creatures, right? Except for these two dragons here. But the rest do not count. It cannot be any of these, especially the first two, because it's not worth it. You are casting this card to draw many cards. You want a dragon in play. So the first thing is it needs a dragon in play, which is not easy to do. And that dragon can be removed in order, uh, removed at instant speed to negate the first half. Let's look at the second half. The second half says you may cast a spell five mana or less from your hand into play without paying this mana cost. Looking down here, we have about 40-ish cards that, you know, that, that fill out that requirement, which is under half of our deck. Though we might count a few less because certain spells don't have the same malleability that you can cast them anytime. We want a, what we want, honestly, is a dragon, right? We want to cast a dragon when we cast Rickshaw's expertise. But you can see here, the list of dragons we can cast is pretty low. So we have only a few dragons. So this doesn't even do the thing that the deck wants to do, or do you drop dragons? This wants to cast a non-dragon card with the hope that that will enable you to get dragons later. So what's the hoop you have to jump? Well, you need a card in hand that is five mana or less, or the second half does nothing. Is that really hard to do? Well, maybe not, but it is important to note that it's very possible to have hands in this deck where none of the cards are actually cards you can play. You got 32 lands and you've got 20 cards. Now, obviously those lands will be, some of them will play. So let's say you've got at least about 40-ish cards that you cannot cast. So there will be some times that you have this spell and you have no creatures. There will be some times where you have this spell and you have no other cards in hand that you can use its second ability for. And in both those cases, happen at the same time, you've got a useless card in hand. Now, before I'm done burying this card with, <laughs> with my, uh, my disdain for it, I want to point out one more thing. I want to ask you, what does this card actually do in your deck? The really obvious and, you know, the, the answer of most likely why it's there is to draw cards. Drawing cards equal to the greatest power among creatures you control when your average power of your deck is so high and that your commander is seven power. Six mana to draw seven cards is really good. But I want you to deconstruct that a little further with the question of why do you need to draw seven cards? 
Because in order to have that scenario, have you played time at? If you've played time at, you've drawn five cards, right? You don't need a six mana draw seven. You have a seven mana tutor five, which is better in every conceivable way. And let's say you've played time at, you've gotten the dragons, you've played out the dragons, the board got wiped. Okay, you're out of cards. What do you do now? Well, time out's back in the command zone. Nine mana feels steeper for five, five cards in your hand, but it's still there. You've been ramping. You'll continue to ramp. You'll draw five. I don't think card draw is a worry in a deck like this. At any moment, you can refill your hand with more dragons. All that, I, I, I just, let's just, let's just finish and say I don't like Rishkar's expertise and let's move on. Um, the last section is enchantments. We are looking at a large group of five mana enchantments. Well, let's go bottom to top. A natural growth. I'm going to talk about color a little early here. That's a lot of green pips. That's a lot of green pips for a support card that does something that dragons are already good at. It says double the power and toughness of each creature you control until end of turn. Well, your creatures are already big. I do understand that like seven to 14 is, is fantastic. I, I do get the power of that, but I just, I think it's too hard to cast. It just doesn't do that much. You could, you could be on a board where the terror of Mount Velus is the only card you have. And yeah, in a way, going from 10 damage with a five double strike to uh, 10 double strike is really, really good, but it's stopped by the same cards that other cards are stopped with, right? It is just, it is just as easily chumped by a, a flying 1-1 one, one spirit token. It hasn't completely changed the setup. When you play something like Salungar, that says whenever dragon control attacks, the defending player's creatures get smaller. Making him into a 614 doesn't change the power of that dragon. The power was in the text box, not in the power and toughness, right? So I don't like unnatural growth. I think there are other effects of this, other ways to play this card that I think uh, are fine. But here, I, I, I don't love it. Mirari's Wake is fantastic. Though it has the Vanquisher's Banner ability, doesn't matter. We won't read that. All, it, doubles, it doubles the mana your lands produce. You need that mana. This is perfect. I love the inclusion. Let's move on. Warstorm Surge, don't love it as much. I think there was a time where this card was printed into every commander deck, and I don't think we should be in that time anymore. This is when creatures enter the battlefield, they deal their power as damage to something. You already have cards that do that, like Scourge of Valcast or um, the Maul of Flames. Uh, these, these creatures already have that effect. Why do you need it again? Wouldn't you rather just play the next dragon and so you can attack? I feel like it's just a bit of a win more strategy. At six mana, that's really expensive. I think I think you'd rather be playing out your dragons and developing your board. So I don't like Warstorm Surge. Lurking Predators, this one is harder to tell because you have to know your play group. Lurking Predators says every time they cast a spell, you reveal your top card. If it is a creature, i.e. a dragon, you put it into play. Though, if it's not a dragon, you'll still put it into play. And then if it's not, you can uh, top or bottom it, which is nice. So, if your play group plays one card at sorcery speed on each of their turns, this is probably a bad card. If your play group plays two spells a turn, this gets a lot better. And then, the next question is, how many times are you going to hit with a creature? For a tribal deck, you only have a third of your deck as creatures, which I'm not saying is incorrect. Dragon decks do look like this, but it's important to note that because of that, cards like Lurking Predators have a higher chance to miss. So sometimes this is going to be a six mana investment that does nothing. This is a bit of calculation. You know your group better than I do. You're going to have to figure out how worthwhile this is. And considering this card fits into a million other archetypes, taking this out doesn't mean your deck, you're never going to use this card. This is a very good card. 
Finally, Zendikar Resurgent, once again, fantastic. Much like Mirari's Wake, the doubling of mana from your lands is exactly where you want to be. And then it also, for some reason, has the other half of Vanquisher's Banner, which is not the good part of this card. Don't get me wrong, drawing a card for Dragon is good, but we've got the same situation where you're probably expected to play one to two dragons. I'm upping that count here because Zendikar Resurgent doubles your mana. So if the theory was you play one dragon a turn, you've made it to two dragons a turn, which is considerably better. Um, already I like it. I have nothing more to say. Definitely play this card. So I'm going to really quickly go over the rest of the pips in terms of color. The second thing I want to talk about was color. You can notice the kind of color trends of your deck. Green and black are kind of your mid-range early game. Then we kind of turn into red, and then later usually we add all of the colors. Except here. Here we have a weird splash of blue. And I just wanted to address this, uh, this, this section on the idea of playing five colors doesn't mean you need to play five colors. A lot of your dragons have blue, but with the unclaimed territory effects, getting blue isn't that difficult. Uh, out, but since that's only for creature spells, I, I don't like it here. I don't like, I don't like the fact it can't cast, especially counter spell, which is two blue pips. I don't want you to be prioritizing putting out blue uh, lands when really what you need is the other colors to use your cultivate Kadama's reaches, use all of your ramp. I don't like these. Um, the, of course, the follow-up question is, when are you holding up mana, right? These, your deck is very, very straightforward and has a strong plan of ramp, dragons, ramp, dragons. Early on, you're ramping, you grab time at, and then you're just slamming dragons down. Every time you play a dragon, you look around the table and go, what are you going to do about this one? And eventually, they won't be able to answer all of them, and you're going to overrun them with dragons. So, when do you have counter spells, and when are they going to be good? What are you afraid of, right? What do you need to counter spell? A board clear? You're already playing Patriarch's Bidding. You could be also playing um, Living Death for another effect that destroys all creatures and then returns your own. Oh, destroys all creatures and returns your creatures, which are much stronger from the graveyard to the battlefield. You could be playing that if you're afraid of board clears. You're already playing Patriarch's Bidding, right? I don't, I don't think you're afraid of board clears. And yeah, you might want to protect your dragons from removal, but that's a one-for-one -one interaction, and you're trading one one-for-one -one interaction for another one. At least some of these dragons, when they come into play, um, they add a, a benefit. They create create damage, they create a token, they do things, whereas Counterspell, you're trading one for one, just straight. You're removing, if they remove the dragon, you would be ahead on the trade, but since you're spending the Counterspell, you're now even on the trade. Do you understand, does that make sense? It's a weird, it's a weird nuance, but it, it is, it is nominal. Um, I think, I think these are just holding you back. I think you should, you can keep Psych Rift because of the sheer strength of it, but for the other ones, I think I would just toss them. And that brings us to our last point, and this is about cohesion and deck plan, and what you what I would like you to put in from the cuts that I have, I uh, have suggested. And honestly, it's just mana rocks. I would like you to play more and more mana rocks. The beauty of being in five colors is that I type signet here, and you can play all of them, right? All ten. 11. I forgot about Arcane Signet. All 11 of these Signets are yours to play, and you should be playing them. Signets are incredibly powerful, not just because they tap for two colors, but they transfer one color into another. They make fixing so much easier because you can, you can build into any direction with minimal cost, and whichever one you play still ramps you, and it fixes your colors into colors you may not have on board. For example, when blue is a problem, all the blue ones are good because they also add another color you need. Specifically, blue green and blue black are uh, dimmer. 
blue black and the blue green ones are going to be and blue red these three will be very useful to you because yeah you need the blue mana and you're still getting one of the colors you need to cast your spells similarly with white mana with Zlesnia, orzov and boros you're still getting the white you need right for later spells that white is rarer to like because white and blue aren't really seen in dragon decks so it's harder to get those colors and you're getting them alongside the colors you need I would play the entire group of them. They are fantastic. They will ramp you to seven and they will continue to be there in play for you. I know this seems like kind of a simple change, but I think it's going to make a big difference. I get the idea that like you've, you've already kind of dabbled in this. You have a bunch of uh, ramp and green here. You have Cultivate and Kodama's Reach. And then you have several mana reducers. Where are they? You have mana reducers, and you have uh, creatures that tap for mana, and you have a few ways, sneak attack and uh, monster manual, that cheat creatures into play. I like all of these, but if you've been watching my videos, what I like the most is a variety of ways to do something. So I also want mana rocks, because those mana rocks will get you the green you need to do these. We'll get you the green for the creatures or the red for the creatures and they'll get you the means to cheat out creatures into play as soon as you have seven mana you're going to draw five cards out of your deck the five best dragons for the situation so getting to seven mana should be your priority Whew! i thought i'd get through that quickly but uh, i have a lot to say i hope this helps um i want to be clear that I, I, I might come off a bit more critical here because what you're trying to do is jump your deck into a new bracket of power level. And usually when we do that, we have to become incredibly strict with ourselves and incredibly critical of the deck itself. A lot of decks do not make this jump. A lot of, de a lot of I've had a lot of situations where someone showed me a deck saying like, hey, I'd like this deck to be, you know, almost competitive, or I would like this deck to be, you know, really strong at this table. And some decks just can't do that. I don't think this is the case. I think you can add a lot of power to this deck by simply going back to some fundamentals of taking out some really flashy cards and putting in more good mana, putting in the ability to grab your commander and going forward. I hope this helps. If you get another draft of the deck, I'd love to see it. And if anyone wants to suggest uh, have a, any deck for me to look at or any draft for me to look at, in the YouTube video description, there is my form that you can fill out and send me a deck. Until then, I'm excited to see more dragons, and I hope you have good luck. Oh, yes, I will say, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, the YouTube thing. Do that too. All right. Good luck.